Do you remember the Taylor story? No. No? Oh, good. Now you have to help with this one. Once upon a time, there was a poor tailor. He made clothes for all the rich people in the town, but he didn't have anything nice and warm to wear himself. And more than anything, he wanted one of those beautiful long jackets that he made for all the rich people. So he saved his money from every job he did, till eventually he had enough money to buy a beautiful bolt of cloth. Hmm. This is perfect for my jacket, he said. And he measured. Can you measure with me? He measured. And he measured. And he measured. And he cut. And he cut. And he cut. And he, and he, and he, and he sewed. And he sewed. And he sewed until he'd made the most beautiful jacket. Oh, oh, oh. He loved that jacket. He felt so proud when he wore that jacket. He wore it in the city. He wore it in the country and he wore it and he wore it and he wore it until it was all worn out. But he was about to throw the jacket away when he... Oh... There's just enough material here to make a woof, woof, to make a coat for my dog. And so he measured. Oh, I knew this one. And he measured. And he measured. And he cut. And he cut. And he cut, and he sewed, and he sewed, and he sewed, until he made a beautiful coat for his dog. And he put the coat on the dog, <laughs> and the dog loved that coat. He felt so proud when he wore it, and he wore it in the city, and he wore it in the country, country and he... Wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it, until it was all worn out. And the dog took off the coat, and the tailor was about to throw it away when he thought, Oh, there's just enough material here to make some pyjamas for my cat. And so he measured, and he measured, and he measured, and he cut, and he cut, and he cut, and he sewed, and he sewed, and he sewed, until he had the cat's pajamas. In this article, we've looked at the quality of storytelling. So I told you the first element is reading through a written text. The second element is storytelling. What about storytelling? We've been tricky. We've given parents a book. Do you know this book? How many people know this story? Oh, you people are too modern. We grew up with this story. And then for you Western people, this is too scary for kids to tell the story. We grew up with the story. It's a wolf that goes and uh, eats those little um, uh, goats. And it's quite dramatic, traumatic, scary story. Um, a bit like... Um, Okay, so we've given a picture book. This is an old fairy tale, like um, the Little Red Riding Hood. Do you know the Little Red Riding Hood? Oh, thank God. Okay, that's quite scary too. Before I tell you about the story, I go back to where I started. This is my backward planning. So I told you about theory of mind and I told you about autism. 
Um, something we know is that people, individuals with autism, uh, they struggle with a concept that we call theory of mind. This is your lesson number what? Four. <laughs> lesson number four. Um, theory of mind is understanding that other people have their own uh, internal mental states. The general idea is we do think of what other people are thinking, right? So for example, if I uh, just start running out, you sitting there thinking, well, what happened to her? What was she thinking about? What is going on in my mind, right? So, um, understanding that there is something going on in my mind sounds funny. It sounds very simple. It's a developmental milestone for children. Also, that people's behavior is based on their mental state. So if I walk outside, it's because something is going on in my head. And then we can have a belief which contradicts the reality. I'll tell you uh, just in a minute what this is. And to predict one behavior, we need to consider their beliefs, either through or false. Our ability to think about mental states is the most important aspect of our uh, lives as human beings. Some people think this is the distinguishing factor uh, between human and all other species. And a theory of mind, having theory of mind will allow us to build successful social and even international political relations. Uh, I'd like you to listen to this talk from Professor Cecilia Hayes. She is a distinguished researcher at the Oxford University in the area of theory of mind. Thanks, Danny. When I hear mind reading. I think of science fiction, you know, I can see into your, into your mind. But that's not exactly how you're using it here. What does mind reading mean in this context? No, that's right. There's, there's nothing spooky about um, the way we're using the term mind reading. It's something that most adults do a lot of the time. Whenever we try to understand what somebody else is doing by assuming that they have certain thoughts and feelings, so say, for example, you were to pause unexpectedly in our conversation. I might ask myself, why is Sarah doing that? And I might infer that you think that I haven't finished speaking and you want me to continue. So I would be explaining your behavior with reference to thoughts and desires in your head. That would be mind reading. It's very important for us to be able to do mind reading. It's one of the things which makes us distinct from other animals as a species. And it's essential for many areas of human life, like the law and negotiating agreements and deciding what behavior is permissible and what isn't. Why is theory of mind and understanding mind reading an important area to study? I think these questions are really important because mind reading is at the root of what makes us human, what makes us different from all other animals. And it's really important to work out how we come to be this way. Is this something that we genetically inherit? Is it something that the members of individual cultures have come up with a theory that they've come up with and that they pass on from one generation to the next. So it's a fundamentally important question about human nature, which also has implications for understanding developmental disorders such as autism and for education in general. We need to use theory of mind to educate our children, not only about the mind, but about a huge range of other topics. So when a child learns from their parents how to represent the minds of others, it is, as we say in the article, a cultural gift that goes on giving. After that capacity has been acquired, it enables that person to pass on what they know about a whole range of topics to others. 
So you heard that about mind reading. This is your homework. When you go home, you do uh, start thinking about what other people know. And you think about how important it is to consider what they know if you want to ask them to do something, if you want to ask kids to do something. They need to know. Sometimes parents say, I'll, I'll be back in half hour, and the child has no idea of half hour, okay? You need to think, what do they know? And if you're a teacher in your class, you do ask yourself, am I using my mind reading abilities to teach these children and, and to communicate with other people? We do couple therapy with the principles of theory of mind. I'm a couple therapist, by the way, as well. It's true. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, how does theory of mind develop? I just um, don't need to tell you this. This is interesting. I'll tell you this. So, assessment of theory of mind. How do we assess theory of mind uh, with kids? Have has any of you seen uh, this scenario somewhere? Mm. Interesting. This is called Sally Ann scenario. Very famous scenario for assessing theory of mind in children. We say a lady comes, her name is Sally, she puts the bread in the basket. Sally leaves the room. When Sally is not here, she doesn't see us, she can't hear us. Anne moves the bread from the basket to the box. Now Sally comes back. Where does she look for the bread? In the basket. Very good. You passed the theory of mind test. <laughs> well, it's an easy answer, isn't it? It is quite easy. It is easy for a three-year-old. They tell you in the box. They're sure it's in the box. They don't tell you they don't know. They say in the box. They need to become four, five, even six to then, like you say, in the basket. Children, with autism, they can't pass a false belief task uh, for quite a, um, older ages. This is called a false belief task. Why? Because Sally has a false belief. Her belief is the bread is in the basket, but the reality is the bread is now moved to the box. But she comes in with her false belief. See, all of these things children need to pass. This is the cognitive development. They need to remember what happened. Remember, she put it in the basket. But then they need to know she acts based on what is going on in her head. They need to know what I know you don't necessarily know. So now I know the bread is moved. But Sally doesn't know. How, how do we acquire knowledge? We need to know, we need to see, maybe I saw it happening, maybe someone told me, maybe I figured it out from a clue. These are all the developmental milestones that children need to pass to answer this simple question. Then we have, so I told you that we gave a book uh, to parents to read, to tell a story to their children. And then we assess those children on their level of theory of mind, but also what we call executive functions. Executive functions on the, are the basic core elements of our brain function that makes us successful, perform well, draw task, um, um, plan, etc., etc., like memory and their language skills. Again, I've put this here to just make sure that you know how good we've done our study, but these are the elements of the uh, quality of stories. And then we assess children. This is, we collected the data. This time, proudly, we assess children uh, when they were six months later, and then we assess them again six months later. I'll tell you the uh, just uh, results briefly. Uh, so, what stories were the best stories? Um, what defines the quality of a uh, story? Danny, would you be kind to bring up that second article, please? Thank you.